Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? See a couple of familiar faces there. That's good. Uh, we're still waiting on a couple of people, so I'm just going to just start in talking a little bit about this in general, this topic. Um, I've been a principal for 23 years, and I think the most important thing that I've ever done with uh, staff has been to really look at grading practices. Um, you know, I put it in the title that uh, grading and assessment are the way, the truth, and the life of a teacher, particularly as you move up the line into uh, middle school and high school. It's uh, the language that you speak, it's the feedback you provide. Unfortunately, the feedback that we provide learners is poor. Um, I think it's one of those areas that you come into teaching with, you don't really get very good instruction in college, and you pretty much are left solo as a teacher in, in, a, in a, any setting because of a lack of staff. You know, uh, we, put, we put principals in charge of instruction for 40 different classrooms or 30 different classrooms. And just the sheer volume of work that you have uh, really limits your ability to provide the feedback that you want your teachers to provide students. You are actually teaching your teachers. So you have to work very smart. Um, out of those activities, the best thing that I can um, point to, and we're gonna get to this actually pretty quick, is that simply by running a student's report of what the teacher is doing in a classroom and providing that type of feedback is a very efficient way for an administrator to measure what's going on. Um, I'd say with this got to the point where uh, when I was a principal in Hutchinson, we had you know anywhere between 250 and 300 classes going on at a given period. And we would, excuse me, 250 or 300 classes in a given term. And we would actually run a grade report on random students from all of those classes, me and my assistant principal. And we just went through with all, of the, all of those things and then coached our teachers back, even if it was a one page summary of what we're observing on there. But you get, uh, you, you get some great um, opportunities to, to get a quick scan of what people are doing, as opposed to sitting in a classroom. How long would it take you to observe a teacher where you could see all of their assessment practices and over the course of a unit. And the answer is like, there's no way you could do it. You might be able to do it for one teacher by simply running a one page report of what's going on in every classroom. You can kind of get into the head of what a student is, is feeling um, in the feedback that a teacher is providing. Obviously I understand teachers are providing a whole lot more feedback than that, but they're showing their, what they put into a grade book they are showing what's important. Um, certainly there's a whole host of other things, but it is a, an efficient way that administrators can have an effect on all classrooms. So um, I'm gonna share my screen. I think that's how I do it. Um, I'm also gonna say that this, uh, this uh, format is a little scary for me. Um, it's hard to talk to people who are, a lot of you maybe have more experience than I do with this. So it's like, I understand that other people have, I'm not saying that I'm the authority on this. I'm really just kind of pointing towards a topic um, that's pretty uh, near and dear to me. So um, like I said, I was a teacher for 10 years. I taught in mathematics in Phi Ed, K-12. So I have a little bit of experience at the elementary, but I uh, have also have experience in a classroom and you know, all the way from uh, middle school, all the way through the high school. And I can tell you that for me, when I first started, um, I pretty much did grading just the way everybody else did. There was, you know, there's eight questions and I give them two points a piece on a quiz that's gonna be 16 points and that they're gonna go in the grade book. The next quiz that I would do might be three days later and I put 12 questions on there and that's 24 points. I started to think about that and was like, was that quiz that had only eight questions more 
or less valuable than the one that had 12? And the answer to that was no. Um, when you were you know, writing in the red grade books 25 years ago, actually 35 years ago, um, you didn't really have ways in which you could, you know, you'd have to really pre-plan and it was just the way the grade book was set up. You just did it that way. I think that's a lot of things what happens in teaching is that we just do it the way that uh, the other person has done it in the past. We do use the book that they did in the past. We assess the way that we, we've seen done in the past. So it took me a long time as a teacher uh, probably to change my assessment practices. And even then, I still think I was learning um, going into the principalship 10 years later. Um, but now with electronic grade books and all the new systems that we have, we have an ability to do a lot more than we ever have. The purpose of grading. Again, most of this stuff that I have in here is plagiarized from people. I will actually cite them at the end, but I don't want you to look at anything and say, boy, you know, I, I think I've read that somewhere before. Um, everything that I talk about, I got it from somewhere else. <laughs> Pretty much uh, supports what my views are on assessment and whatnot. Um, but we've emerged from an area of an era of assessing merely to rank students and sort students um, to a system that says who has and has not met standards. Um, I realize also that the pandemic has really kind of shook the foundation of content people because um, a lot of people are saying testing's not important anymore and content isn't important. Uh, the most important thing is just uh, connecting with your kids. And I, I actually agree with a lot of that. You know, I think, uh, you know, we've always thought we were kind of a daycare service. And I believe that's true. I think we do a great job with the personal side. Um, and I think kids have told us through all the distance learning that we've had to do that perhaps there's things that are more important than the content. Um, and I think that's just been heightened by the pandemic. So it'll be interesting how the standards argument uh, continues on as we move forward uh, after the pandemic, at least prior to our next pandemic. Um, but I still think that content is important. I've always been very, uh, uh, very uh, focused on the meat of a course. What, what is really the meat of, of the course? In fact, I would even go one step further. I think we have too much meat in our classes that we don't even know what is the meat and what is the fat um, because we have so many things that we're assessing. Um, I've said this. 10,000 times to teachers, you know, you're working way too hard on, on grading and you're not working on, you know, just the formative assessment part. You're not providing feedback because you're so busy um, grading things. The plight of a high school English teacher, you know, grading essay after essay, and it's like the taxing amount of, of this assessment. And I go, you know, the interesting thing is that it takes you three weeks to get your feedback back. By the time your students get that feedback back, uh, it doesn't even mean anything to them. So you're actually working really hard at something that doesn't even matter. And you can see that through their grade book. To do this, of course, you need to know what standards are most important <coughs> and the how of how you're going to do that. What we teach is important. It's a concept uh, centered on what is truly important, clearly and completely integrated into learning progressions within and across grades. Um, for instance, uh, ratio and proportion in mathematics is very important. You should really know how that ratio and proportion is um, brought up in fourth grade, um, how it's covered in fifth grade, how it gets into pre-algebra in seventh and eighth grade, how it, uh, you know, into rational numbers and decimals and percents, how they all relate to each other. As a math teacher, you need to know how this concept gets developed. Qualified educators consistently interpret them to mean the same thing uh, within developmental reach of the students. So if you have so many things and you already know that half your kids aren't gonna you know, meet those standards, your standards are probably not flexible enough for you to teach in a regular ed high school class. Um, you have to have multiple, um, I would say outcomes that you are going to accept and learn that everybody's not going to get them to the same level. So your feedback systems, not just an A, B, C, and a D, but your feedback systems have to provide the feedback that's going to help students learn down the road. 
If these criteria are not met, then both quality assessment and effective instruction will not happen. And that would be my contention. For the most, for the most part, uh, most of our teachers are not providing quality instruction and assessment. It's okay, but it's, it's not anything that's going to um, really provide the feedback necessary to the limited number of content standards that are going to be important to the learner. Um, so I think you gotta know where you're going and I think you gotta have everything else focused in that direction. Uh, some would say this is like the definition of formative and summative assessment. What role can you play? Um, anybody that knows me knows that I am uh, pretty big into uh, athletics and coaching. And I'd say about 15 years ago, um, I felt like no matter what I did with teachers, it wasn't working. And it was like, I really started thinking about the coaching aspect. Why was it that I was able to convey things as a coach that I wasn't as a teacher and in that case, as a principal? And I really got back down to look at how the coaches provide feedback to their athletes. You know, just as an example, when somebody's dribbling down the floor, I might say, say, you know, these things on the way down, you know, plant your foot, cross over, push the ball out ahead, um, dr dribble with your fingers, don't use your palms. This is in one trip down the floor. That is the model that most can identify with, with some, uh, some type of activity that you've had that. Um, coaches will say when we get to 18 basketball players on a team, it's like, we need another coach because I can't provide enough feedback for my players. In football, as a football coach, if you've got 50 players, you probably need at least five coaches to provide the feedback necessary. Even then, you've got on any given play, you've got maybe 22 people that are doing all different things that you have to look at this whole scan of things and provide feedback for them. But coaches are constantly providing feedback. And unfortunately, teachers are, are rarely providing that feedback. It's not specific. It doesn't talk about the, the actual um, fundamentals of how you do something. It's mostly um, post-mortem where you say, yeah, we taught this. And at the end of the unit, I see that you didn't get this concept. So using formative assessment techniques all the way around um, are definitely very important. And also providing specific feedback as to what, what a student is missing is really important. And for a teacher, they have to, they have to change their practices to be able to do that. Technology there again has a, an opportunity for you to do that. Uh, we simply do not pr provide good enough feedback in most instructional activities. Hardly anyone does it to the level of coaching. And I, I find that uh, very interesting. How many of our teachers, that's not a thou, it's how, how many of our teachers are grading consistently within our district framework? Do you even have a district framework? Do you teach your teachers what you're expecting when, with in, in terms of grading and assessment? What is the true inventory of our current practices? And here I talk about the grade book chart for each teacher in the district and spend the next months interviewing each teacher about what you observe. So taking that one page summary, which again, anybody knows me, I try to keep it pretty simple. But the bottom line is I take their own work and I just make notes on it. And then I let them answer the questions and say, Hey, why do you, uh, why do you, do you have a hundred points on this test and you got 50 points on this exam? Was that uh, intentional? <clears throat> Usually it's not, but sometimes they'll say, yes, this covered two weeks of work and that covered one week of work. That's the response that I would want to hear. What types of feedback do your teachers provide for your students based on what their course objectives are? Is the feedback more than numeric or symbolic? So, when you are doing systems of equation, you are breaking down at the point where when we see the greater than or equal sign, you don't seem to have this concept down. Oh, that's what I'm missing. You know, I'm using a dotted line instead of a solid line because of the equal sign. That is specific feedback. How qualified are your principals or you to recognize the bias that can be inadvertent and unplanned? Um, the teacher who's, who inadvertently has had 75% of the course 
has been based on a project at the end of a term. And when you ask them, you know, why is that worth so much? Well, it's the culminating activity and it includes everything we did the whole, the whole term. The problem with that is, did you provide specific gateway feedback to let them know where they are in that battle? If it is 120 points at the end of the term or 500 points, I mean, the whole litany of things I've seen, you could have provided specific feedback, even if it was numeric, you know, at the quarter poll, at the half poll, at the three quarters poll in the final. Um, is the data at the end or is the, the grade or the assessment at the end, can you go back and change grades from before because they suddenly have the concept? You know, just as a real clear example, what happens if I knew 50% of whatever you assessed, again, if you were assessing homework, and I got two out of five, three out of five, two out of five, three out of five, two out of five, three out of five, and I do it for 15 days, that's 75 points. So now it's the homework now is worth 50% of a grade, and I give a 75 point test and I get 75 out of 75. Do you go back and change those other 75 points to say, they aren't even part of the grading process. Um, there are ways to do that, of course, too, is that if the homework is not part of the grade, then those two, two out of five and three out of five, that was good feedback because it's not, it's not a terminal grade. Um, so again, one of the things I remember uh, doing, and I don't think I started doing it till maybe my fifth or sixth year of teaching, is when a kid when a kid did better on the test than they had done on the feedback or on the on the learning activities all the way, including a half halfway point quiz, which was pretty standard for me, there might be eight to ten uh, lessons in a unit, and I might have given a quiz at the you know after the fourth or fifth unit, um, fourth or fifth activity, and if they did better on the test, I would go back and I would either scratch that grade or make it look exactly like the test score because that's what quote what percentage they received on their um, stuff but if you get 75 out of 75 at the terminal activity of a unit chances are you really knew it and your feedback should support that anything that does not that's not consistent with that is really deserves scrutiny uh this is these are from schmoker um um, results, um, the book, again, I read this probably, oh shoot, 20 years ago probably is when we got into Schmoker. Uh, Mike Schmoker, who was a high school English teacher. Um, concepts and assessment are related. So the main concepts of a course and the assessment need to be related. What we teach and how we teach are two emphases. That's the second big idea. What we're going to teach and how we're going to teach it is an important concept in your grading and assessment package. A lot of times that's not connected. They teach stuff and they grade stuff and they're not necessarily related. This particular activity was worth 25 points on this day. It was a crossword puzzle we did on a Friday because we had a pep fest and inadvertently that became way more valuable than I, than I would have wanted it to be. Um, we need a better harmony between learning and work ethic principles of grading, effort and participation points. Research indicates there's a 15 to one ratio between stuff to the reading, actual reading and writing. Again, uh, Mike Schmoker was very big on, on critical reading and making sure that people are, are on, on topic with the things that are most important. The stuff definition, games, worksheets, posters, presentations, movies, cut and paste, designing brochures, skits, collages, you know, the uh, presentations that we have in front of the class where we do a, a long project and it takes us two weeks, but then it takes us two weeks to have that kid present in front of the class. Uh, what a waste of time. Doesn't mean that it's a bad activity. It means that you're using a lot of class time that you could have been using on content. Schmoker defines the Crayola curriculum as 
that we've been stunned kids were given more coloring assignments than math or writing assignments. I want to repeat that because I'm not joking nor exaggerating. And he's using a quote from Haycock. And as a, an administrator, uh, how many times do we walk into a class and I go, gosh, I think every class is an art class in this school. And I, I say it kind of half jokingly, and it's, it's also half serious, is that I want them to hear that, is that, you know, there's so many times that we are off task with the things in the classroom. And I get that we can do that some of the time, but we do it far too often. Um, a lot of times could be because we need a break or seemingly that teacher uh, takes a lot of breaks. Um, we are remodeling our high school right now, actually our whole district right now. And we just did an assessment of the inventory that we were going to keep. And so we went around the entire building and I swear 75% of the storage um, areas that we had in classrooms had board games in it. And I'm like, does everybody need to have a board game in their classroom? It's crazy to me. Or do they have all this stuff there that they just kind of randomly pick and choose and when they have free days or whatever, that they pull all the junk out and they just throw them out in front of kids as a way to placate them, keep them busy. Um, which if you use the daycare idea, uh, I suppose that's important to us because if we're only really worried about you know, finding activities for kids to do and we don't necessarily care about the content, then I guess that would be part of what we're doing. That's our, that's, our, that's our curriculum, the Crayola curriculum. To improve our instruction, uh, we need to amend this ratio. We need to write more and we need to grade less. As English teachers, you know, that's one of the feedback things that I'd always provide is that you are spending way too much time on grading and you need to let the kids read and write and you do not have to assess everything. Um, if there's a, if you've got 90 essays that you need to gra um, grade on a sophomore English class in a composition class, you better have those essays. You better be really skilled at being able to just identify a paragraph or two that you're reading from each. Otherwise, you're gonna, you're not gonna get the the assignments back or the the paper back to the kid where there's meaningful feedback. Writing aids in cognitive development to such an extent that the upper reaches of Bloom's taxonomy could not be reached without the use of some form of writing. Writing is this metacognitive activity of, of the upper reaches that you, it's critically important for kids, but it's critically important teachers don't feel they have a need to assess everything. Um, assessment practices are basically flawed. There are very few examples of teachers who know exactly how their assignments are clear clear, coherent, and aligned with their intentions. Very few. This is actually going to be the, when we finish this little presentation here, that's where I'm going to go to, or it's in the presentation. Okay, come on, turn. I think I might have skipped one here. Yes. I did. Okay. Computer was uh, balking. Um, Traditional versus new assessment. I'm gonna check one more to make sure I didn't, yep, we're good. Um, traditional versus new assessment. Traditional assessment or a lot of the things I've described, classroom activities guide the grading. Um, grades for attitude, effort, and participation. Um, I call them warm body points. Um, they basically check status, focus on tests and assignments and they give snapshots of what students have learned. And they, I mean, they're terminal assessments. Uh, on that day, on Wednesday, October 17th, that test that we took, it, we don't look forward, we don't look backward. It's that day only. And how you did on it is totally gonna dictate uh, your grade. New assessment looks different. Standards guide assessment and learning. You assess on what you know and understand. Um, it's malleable, it's flexible, it, it's fluid. Your assessment's changing all the time. Your, un your understanding of concepts is constantly changing. You individualize, you personalize. You monitor student learning at all time. You provide feedback for those things. You have a panoramic view of everything that's going on. So I'm looking at this whole child over a whole term and I'm looking at all of these feedback things that are available and make sure that uh, 
um, the students are getting that and that I'm not determining whatever assessment you are going to provide at the end of a unit. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about the big picture as a teacher. Grading does not equal assessment. So again, formative assessment is one of those things that every good teacher does and it's way more important than the grade. Um, I would say to the point that I don't even know the grades are that important. It's really the concepts and how you're learning them and having systems in place that you can provide feedback towards the content that was actually learned in a classroom. Uh, Rick Stiggins stated it like this, assessments used for learning instead of a snapshot of learning. So it's constantly, constantly looking before and after. Where is this concept leading? Where did it come from? Where did the student go along the way? And I should be able to see that in whatever document I use for that child. Um, one of the most, one of the best uh, people to listen to, and again, this is why I'm, I'm just leaving the links. Uh, Ken O'Connor um, has a webinar. It, this is like an hour long webinar. Um, I will try to keep it short today, but I do want you to go watch that webinar. That would be your homework assignment. There's a couple things in here. Also Dylan Willem um, is another one that I just think uh, uh, these, these people are folks that have uh, pretty much come to the same conclusion that everybody comes to is that our assessment practices are flawed. Uh, Ken O'Connor does the 15 fixes for broken grades. And I will, uh, you know, I will talk about those quickly. Um, but I have compiled a set of grading reports for a student at our high school of which I'm still the de facto principal. I don't really do as much principal stuff. I do the evaluation. I do the counseling and the registration stuff with kids, but I'm not in the, the day to day uh, discipline stuff. So um, I'm principal in name only really. There will be some redundancy, but I want to show you that nearly every grading scheme has its bias that your teachers and you as the chief leader need to be aware of. Tell me if you can see this when I open it. I wanna make sure that you guys are looking at the same thing. Can you see that? I need feedback. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a second. Um, I just want to get an idea of, of who's out there and where you're from so I know the context of what we're dealing with before I go in. Emily, you're the first on my screen. I'm Emily Gartner. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for Columbia Heights Public Schools. Nice to meet you. You too. Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Schmidt, Superintendent at Becker Public Schools. How you doing, Jer? Good, good. How are you? Uh, Brooke Peterson, or Brooke? Uh, hi, I'm Brooke. I am the Director of Teaching and Learning with Intermediate School District 917. And 917 is where? We serve the Southwest Metro. Our office is located in Rosemont. Okay, thank you. Brent? Hey, Brent Nelson, Mora High School Principal. Thanks for doing this today, Pat. Thanks, Brent. Um, Tara? Good morning. I'm Tara. I'm the Director of Teaching and Learning in Columbia Heights. Nice to meet you. Zena. Good morning. Uh, Zena Stenvik, Superintendent, Columbia Heights Public Schools. Nice to meet you. Nathan. Nathan Schweder is Assistant Principal at Stride Academy in St. Cloud. Welcome, Nathan. Rachel Johnston. I'm Rachel Johnston, I'm the Special Ed Coordinator for District 197, West St. Paul. Thank you. Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Leiftow. I'm one of the Assistant Directors of Special Ed at Prior Lake Savage. Nice to meet you, Kristen. Julie. Julie Gackle. Okay, Jody Olson. I see Jody put in the chat. Um, Jody Olson from Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf. I'm uh, assistant director using captions instead of an interpreter. Okay, thank you. John Engstrom. He's in here twice, actually. 
Chris Swenson. Chris Swenson, superintendent and holding board. Hey, Chris. Uh, Jill Kenton. Hi, I'm Jill Kenton. I'm a student services um, supervisor in the North St. Paul district. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Gina Minerts. Hello, I'm Gina Minerts. I am the assistant superintendent in Spring Grove. Welcome. Howard Armstrong. And Luke Kielland. I am Luke. I'm the principal in Spring Grove. Welcome. Did I miss anybody? Okay. I'm going back to uh, share screen then. And I'm going to take you through about 10 courses and just the type of uh, one page summary that I'm talking about. I have blacked out the name of the student, so uh, um, I will not share this with you, um, but I'm just gonna give you an example of this student. Um, the uh, progress grade um, for a student, this is in a, uh, a course, an unnamed course, uh, of which this student has got an A minus. Uh, this is at the six week poll. So the daily points times two, they gave 10 points, um, Looks like they're giving 20 points a week. So they gave 20 points for this week. Daily points, they got 40 points for this week. Daily points, 40 points for the next two weeks. Daily points, and then we go to week six. There's a business plan. And then week eight is another participation points. The entirety of this course is built on participation points. The one thing the teachers did do is they metered out their points in even intervals, but I don't know what happened in week one or week seven, but there's nothing there for that. There are no names of anything in here, so I have no idea what this student was doing. It wasn't a business class, so I assume there's activities, you know, daily points, you know, on what? Um, it's not specific. A parent looks at this. They're just going to look at the grade for the most part. A kid is just going to look at the grade. And if they see this A minus there, they're, they're not gonna look, they're not gonna think about what they're learning. Uh, what were they learning? I have no idea. Should we communicate that instead of just daily points? So I think the metering here was good. I think the concept stuff and the, the distribution of, of worth and value is actually pathetic in this case. Um, Okay, this one is a, okay, this is a, I believe it's a college class actually, which is also scary. Um, but in this particular example, I had to go through and calculate this and this because the teacher didn't want to show that. And the reason they didn't want to show that is because the teacher was taking this data and then just at the end of the at the end of the course had some sort of side grade book where they were calculating that grade. So as a math guy, I'm always when I go through this with the teacher, the points are not summarized. 108 out of 170 is not 68.35. So I have no idea how they came up with the grade. The 115 out of 152 is not the grade that they had on there. How did this student even earn 76.2% of the course? So when I did speak with this teacher about it, that teacher could not explain how that occurred. The only thing they could say is that I look at everything and then I provide feedback to them as we go along. And the grade is kind of subjective is, is the, the com comment that I got. It's not transparent. There is no initial plan. It's just basically assessment on the fly. Uh, they're masking factors that are not visible. And in the end, the grading was totally subjective. 
I could go to another student and I did go to another student and I found a student who had less than 60% here and less than 60% here, but they had a B plus. So the feedback in that particular course has no relevance to the standards, is very difficult to follow. And as a student, you'd be like, I have no idea how you calculate my grade, which is precisely what this student told me. Um, in this particular class, um, certainly we can't tell what kind of class it is because we got week one, week two, week three. And so I started saying, okay, so I looked at all this data and I look at week one is easy, week two is easy, 10, 10, 10. And in this interval was like, now it's a two week interval. There's only 10 points for those two weeks. So again, homecoming or whatever, but there's only 10 points in there. You can see none of the, none of the learning activities are described. And then in this week, we catch up and we make this week catch up. So we're equaling the number of points and they gave 10, 10 and 10 that week. Uh, tried to keep it going here, but then we really lose it at the end. This is now in the second half of the first semester because we started in August. And then we have a 3.6A. Don't know what that is. Maybe it's a standard, uh, which would be nice to know, you know, Minnesota, Minnesota standard 3.6A or whatever. I don't know what that is, but that was worth 24. And then 3.6B was worth 27. Suddenly in week eight, now week eight, we assigned 20 points instead of the 10 that they, they did early. Um, then I just drew a line here. <clears throat> first half of the term, second half of the term, there were 151 points at the, in the first half of the semester and 90 points in the second half of the semester. Why, why did that occur? That teacher has no idea why that occurred. In fact, this is in a computer programming language, Python. What is important if you're going to program in Python? Where do we see the value in the assessment? Well, this week was the most important week. It is only one week out of 18, but it actually is one eighth of the, of the course. And they seem to be just random participation points. What if a kid is gone that week? What if they don't even uh, bother to check whether they they completed that assignment. What if the only thing they do is they look at the end and say, well, I'm getting a B, I don't care, which is a very common uh, response from a high school kid. Why did this student earn an A minus? Do they even know how to program in Python? Where's the feedback? You know, in, re in, in replacement of all this, I would take one paragraph from the entire semester that tells me how this child knows how to, lang how to program in Python. Next course. This is one student, by the way. So this is what this student is seeing in terms of the assessment that they have in the classes that they have. So in this particular class, they have 56, point, 56 points in the first half of the class, and 55 in the second half of the class of, and this was a second term thing. So this is like, uh, this is like a six week poll for the student. And so it's given one on the first half of a unit and one on the second. Now, what I can say is they at least tried to balance, you know, the 6.1 to 6.4 with the 6.5 to 6.8. So we're assuming relatively equal content. And I'd say, well, good. However, I would say, is that the only thing we can see? You know, one thing that uh, the Hutchinson, uh, Hutchinson teachers in the math department, they were really good with assessment, but they would list out all of these formative things that they're checking, these checks, and then they would put like a zero in the grade book. So you could see how the formative um, be activities were developing the assessments. And of course, because of that, the formative things are really developmental. So you can see where they were and you can see where they, where they are at certain guideposts. And so both of those things were there, but the assessment part of it was only written in here. 
Uh, not to mention, how do I assess even a single question in a mathematics course? You know, am I using rubrics? If I use rubrics and I've got a three point rubric and the kid has most of that stuff, but not all of it, and they get two out of three. And this is actually a case from this class where that teacher, this teacher does use a three point rubric, but was converting things back two thirds would be 67%. So if you got most everything, you would get two thirds or a D plus in that particular teacher's course. Consequently, the grades are low because they lose on the rubric. Uh, this is a course where the student has 87.5%. So it's a project personalized learning chart. Um, I don't know what this class is anymore. I can just tell you that they did a personalized learning chart. I do know the class now, this is a social studies class. Um, what they did in each unit is they had 100 points on the personalized learning chart and they gave 50 points on the exam. So the personalized learning chart is worth two thirds of a grade and the exam on the content is worth one third. Really helps kids get better grades. And in this case, the student had 60% on the first assessment, 74% on the second set assessment, and 74%, even if that was excellent portrayal of what the student knew, this student is probably, even if you convert it back, that's a C minus at best. The breakdowns are good. Unit seven was worth 150, unit eight was worth 150, and unit nine was worth 150 but that two thirds, one third, probably not. Um, once again, the teacher, this is one thing that a teacher, the, the teacher did well too. Um, they had 12 days for their unit seven. They had 12, day, 12 days for their unit eight and their 12 days for the unit nine. So 12 days did equal 150 points per 12 days in that teacher's course. Are you guys sick of this yet? Is this obnoxious? I would say no, I think this is helpful. Okay. I mean, I have, I have a few more examples. I'll just uh, go through. There might be some redundancies, um, but you're hopefully getting the drift now. You're, we'll probably go through this a little bit quicker now. Um, so here's the next class, holy cow. Um, don't know what, but this, this student's getting an A minus. Okay. This is a college class too. I do know the class now. Um, so I calculated the points that they had assigned. Their daily work was worth 27%. Their labs were worth 12%. Their projects were worth 60%. And their one test that they had, one exam was worth 7%. I can't imagine that the college would like to see if they were checking that our one test in a college econ class was worth seven points. Uh, their distribution was not bad. There's 263 in the first six weeks, 231 points in the second six weeks, and there was 255 in the third six weeks. And that's something that I do focus a lot with uh, young teachers, but really all teachers is in that unit planning is making sure that you, that you don't inadvertently, you know, uh, tack on all of your points at the end of the term. And one egregious example, I remember a science teacher um, and they were a ninth grade science teacher and they had about two thirds of their points were assigned in the last two weeks of the, of the spring term in May. And there was like 120 points in the first 14 weeks of the class. And in the last two, three weeks, it's like five, 600. Meanwhile, that person was also a track coach. They were gone half of that time. When did the students get the feedback? Well, they never got it. They, they just got it in the form of a grade in the summer. So um, the teacher just had all these multiple projects and then just started throwing out points at the end of a term. So I'm always looking at the number of days of instruction. And so I have that over here. So anytime that you're giving an assessment of any sort and you're gonna assign value to it, you're, you're saying that you value it, I wanna know how did that 
term breakdown. Uh, the U of M medical terms in this case, um, 25 points. Medical breakdown, 35. Um, language of anatomy, excuse me, this is, a, this is a college science class. This was not college econ. Uh, we're going to look at that one next. Um, tissue lab, path, passive digestion. So then I looked over here. I really like the detail of this one, by the way. That's really good. I know, at least I know what they were doing. But the distribution of course points. This was 8.3 points per day. Um, this one is 14 points per day. This infertility project is worth 26.5 points per day. But, you know, this is, this is erose. This is not good. There are some activities that are this infertility project and this pig dissection project, they were the major parts of the class. That you had to do well on here to carry your grade. So one exam for the entire term, and again, was the tissue lab more valuable than the, the other labs? Probably not. Uh, wasn't the sheet dissection also a lab? So there again, they have this these tracks in here, but the, sh the sheep brain dissection was, you know, if you group these all like in a lab grade, where I knew that lab grades were 25% of the grade, Daily work was 25% of the grade and then categorize these things. That'd be a whole lot better assessment. Now this teacher is a phenomenal teacher, but not a phenomenal grader. Uh, how much of this class did you, you know, aim to value the labs, projects and exams? <clears throat> the total value of this was 9.5 points per day. So Again, that infertility project was worth three times the value that day. And if you missed it that day, that's a bad day to miss. Um, here again, first six weeks, 60. This is a chem class. Second six weeks, 82. And the third six weeks was 338. Was this quiz here, 72 points, worth three times as much as the other three. So I underlined quiz, lab quiz, lab quiz, bonding quiz. Well, what kind of, what kind of quiz was this one? Was this based on stoichiometry or this one, lab quiz? I don't know what it was. Um, at the end of the term, another benefit is that when I'm talking to kids who are ineligible or they're risking ineligibility and I go, Hey, uh, Craig, you're, uh, you've not turned in your bonding quiz yet. The bonding quiz, what are you talking about? I turned that in two weeks ago. And I, so then I email the teacher or talk to the teacher and I go, he said he turned it in two weeks ago. Oh, that's right. I put it in that one bag. I forgot about that. But all too often, I would find that these holes in the whole assessment package of a teacher they weren't being followed up by kids, parents, or the teacher. The only thing kids and, and teachers, kids and parents are looking at is the, is the some grade. They're trained. So the final six weeks had 70% of the value. Again, if you were doing something in December, uh, that'd be a tough time to be missing chemistry class. Finally, we had 25% of all of the points and all of the value of the course happened on the final day before Christmas. I assume that they got an open book test that they did and they had to go through that and they probably got to do it as a group, but ultimately it had a lot of value and probably little to do with content or understanding. Um, this is a English class. Um, distribution of points. Tests were 26.6. Warm body points means you were just in school. You happen to have people around you that were doing work. You were doing work, but you mostly got points for just being there. 60%. Final, 6%. Participation, 8%. Are these weighted or not? The answer is no. You got a test category here and you give these different exams. I gotta, I'm got i going to blow this up a little bit. Should have done that earlier. Sorry. Um, so this chapter one, two intro test is worth 55 or 4.5 points per day. The next supply and demand test 
was worth 1.5 points a day. The chapter four test was worth 7.5 points per day. Elasticity, 4.5, and the exit ticket there was worth 3.6. Um, was chapter four worth five times more than chapter three exam on supply and demand? Was chapter four worth five times more than the chapter three exam on supply and demand in a college e economics class? Answer is clearly no. Supply and demand is a critical concept in a college eco economics class. And yet it had, one, it had one fifth of the value of something else, which I don't know because they didn't put that in. They just put chapter four. Who chooses what amount finals are worth in your class? For this particular teacher, um, I think they have a final at the end, product creation, a lot of stuff. Okay, final, 50, 50 points on the final. So 50 points out of 850, that's 1 17th or about 6% of the class. Final, final test day, product creation, who knows? Are any of these things weighted? They're separated but they're not weighted. It's, this is a random class. If I were a college, I would not let that teacher teach using that assessment anymore. Until they change their practices. All right, um, last one, I think. Um, here again, you see this daily points thing. There's you know, three days, daily points, uh, three, one, one, one. So the first three weeks of the class, they put daily points week, week three or week two. It really, that was three weeks of instruction worth 20 points, 20, 20, 20. Uh, we had this teacher earlier. So we, we know what this teacher does. This is their grading. This is how they grade. That's again, it's scary. I have followed up with these people just so you know. Um, um, the last one here is again, the flowers reflection, very descriptive. It really helps. Geraldo, no last name, that particular assignment, that really helps. Quiz three, chapters nine through 12. Um, I assume it's on this book, uh, Bless Me Ultima. Um, and we can kind of figure that out here. Uh, so we look at this book of Bless Me Ultima. Um, how many pages did we read and how many days of instruction? So um, I don't know how many pages it was. I do know it was seven days of instruction for chapters one through three. And then we burned through uh, chapters four through eight. There's five chapters there. And it was really only three days worth of stuff. Um, five, three, and three. And the points vary. This five, five week um, or quiz three over four chapters worth 18 points. This one's worth five chapters or over five chapters and it's worth 12. So nine days at 45 points with five points per day for minor tasks and itinerant activities and 29 days or 85 points, three points per day on major accessible activities. A month and a half of study. It's, it's bad. Okay, so I'm going to stop again there. Um, I want you guys just to reflect on what I just covered. Any feedback? Anybody? Patrick, I, I do. It's been a while since I've had to use a grade book myself. However, um, just knowing how I'm working with our special education teachers and how to get some of their grading up to par just outside of just being straight class grading and or to IEP based grades. But it's um, fascinating to see how differently people view it. And I found that very interesting and helpful. This is really common. <laughs> um, this is this is not these are not unique examples. This is this is through the eyes of one student. 
these these are the classes that they had two two or three of those are college classes now um i i have not done this at bbe before because in my role as a superintendent i have with a few teachers but I've i didn't go through it like i did this um but again i know that our teachers need training on how how to assess students um, there's mistakes made all over the place. Next, anybody else? I want to hear from Emily. You got, I'm going to pick you because your, uh, your face is showing up. Because I turned my camera on. <laughs> yes. Um, I did several days of uh, PD for teachers last week, and it really gave me empathy for how hard it is to have just a screen full of black squares. So I try to turn my camera on more now. Oh, okay. Um, I think that this would be a helpful exercise. I know we've done a lot of work in our high school to align what we're putting in the grade book so that teachers of similar content are grading the same things. But I think we have some work to do on why are we grading those things and how are we grading those things and how is that beneficial to students? So um, that was one thing at Hutchinson. It definitely we, we had uh, we would have like four teachers teaching biology. So I'm not going to get to all this, of course, but uh, um, where I would say once we figured that out is like, you know, these these students have to have the same assessment package for a biology class, no matter who teaches it. And we had so the way the way we kind of uncovered that is we started calculating all of the grades, you know, so what is our ninth grade median grade? What is our 10th grade median grade? What is our 11th grade GPA basically? What is the GPA in every class biology class our average GPA was like 2.7. Um, so what happened though, is that in certain, certain teachers, we would calculate the average for a teacher in, I'll just say, uh, world history. And one teacher's got a 2.42 GPA and another one's got a 3.5 GPA. And these are random students. Clearly the benefit was, would get the teacher where you'd get a 3.5. However, does that have anything to do with the learning? And the answer is no. We don't even know that the, maybe the kids in the class with 3.5 did nothing and the teacher just doesn't have very good assessment package. Maybe the students that are in the 2.4, maybe they learn the most and the best. Maybe that teacher, you know, did the best. You have to have some commonalities across your school. One of the uh, bits of research I can remember reading, and I think it was part of the uh, um, Dufours and the PLCs, was that you have to have grades mean something similar across your building or kids will never know, you know, what your, you know, what you value. So um, the numeric stuff, again, I'm a math teacher. I love statistics. That's, that is one of the crazy aspects of me, but it's that you can actually quantify um, a lot of things to, to create comparisons. You know, when I brought that social studies data back to the social studies department, because that was an internal document that we used for social studies teachers, um, you know, it was how do the grades, how come the grades are so much higher in this person's class? Another thing that happened to us in Hutchinson, because we had a junior college in our school, certain teachers that were, that were um, I would say, aberrant with their grading practices students learn to avoid it's like I can go take this class at at Ridgewater because I don't want to run through this teacher's assessment scheme and so they were actually taking college to finish high school just as they had no intention of getting a college degree they just knew it'd be easier to get through blank than it would be to get to do it at the high school the fact that they can do it online is a new element is like oh yeah I'll just do it online because the colleges are going to admit them <laughs> They're gonna let they're gonna enroll those juniors and seniors. You know, PSEO has gotten uh, even more liberal, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but we're always in comparison to everything. So we have to have a full context of what we're assessing and why we're assessing it. Um, anybody else? John Engstrom, do you have anything to say? Uh, really? Thank you. Oh, okay. Specific feedback, John. Uh, as someone who did grading and assessment reforms in um, two different districts, uh, I just appreciate the fact that uh, others are joining in the fight. 
And um, it's kind of interesting timing here at Carleton because we we don't really know what our future holds, but uh, I still enjoy just kind of hearing anything that has to do with grading assessment and how it can get better. Awesome, that, that response was awesome. Thanks, John. I'm gonna go back because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a few more things to, to just show. Again, most of this stuff is not mine, but uh, okay, not that here. Uh, let's see, stop share for a second. With technology, I'm just trying to avoid obsolescence. Um, it's hard when you don't teach every day anymore to be fully versed on all the different things that we have to use nowadays. Okay, I'm up here, I'm gonna start there. Okay, summarized. And this gets into uh, um, just some of my philosophies too. Um, each concept, day, week, quiz, exam, may have the same value. In unit planning with teachers, I typically will start out with something, something very simple and concise, like 10 points per day per term. If you have 85 days of instruction, you now have 850 points to plan out. Where do you want these things to go? How can you ensure equal, equality assessments and equality between the above? Now, when it comes to standards-based grading, that's totally different where the grade doesn't really matter and the grade is going to be based on something a lot more global then i certainly am going to look at the assessment package differently um i just in my in my opinion i think most teachers even if they're in standards-based grading are still assigning grades based on some sort of point or weighting system assessments that include both formative and summative assessment should have the equivalent value to their worth for a term. Points-based system rarely equate to what the teacher wanted or the student deserved. For instance, 60% exams, 20% projects, and 20% daily work. This is a seventh grade math problem, and I will tell you that 90% of your teachers cannot do this without- Patrick, we don't see your screen. I'm not sure if you're sharing right now, but- oh trying to share we don't see it though okay sorry about that it's part of the powerpoint you're going to see it all right thank you so this is what i just said oh my gosh so again for instance 60 percent exams 20 percent projects and 20 percent daily work I can work with that because I at least I know where the what the teacher is trying to do. When doing this, you also have to ensure that these values occur with intent. I have seen even with this, I've seen you know egregious violations. Um, for instance, uh, where one quiz is worth thirty percent of the grade because they put twenty percent quizzes and they only had one quiz. It was worth three times more or four times more than a test or or. In one case, the teacher inverted our district grading. Um, we had 90% was based on um, content and standards, 10% on daily work. But after about week 11 in a, in a science class, they had it backwards. And they're like, should I just change it and go 90, 10 the other way? And I go, God, no, you've got 100 and, 125 biology students. If you change the grades on all of those at this point, you're going to change everyone's grade. People that were getting A's are going to be getting F's and people that are F's are going to be getting A's. And it's because of a mistake that, that you made a long time ago. Now, I would say I would hold harmless for those kids that were damaged by the fact that they know the content and are di disserviced by your grading. I would make amends to them, but I would not change the grades of everybody on week 11 of a 12 week class. Have you ever had that happen? Oh my gosh, that's happened to me multiple times. Not to me, but to our students. Learning activity description should reflect the concept that was taught. Give a clear description of the activity. On a particular unit that looks like another, there should be a consistency of points and weights to ensure that one unit of assessment doesn't end up being 
far more important than another. Do you provide qualitative feedback on each major assessment, whether it was a project, test, or a study? Or do you simply at the end of a, an exam put B um, or the, of a course, a B? Do the points you actually assign reflect the importance of the conceptual framework for the course? Usually the answer is no. What is your overall distribution between formative and summative? Do you even know the difference between formative, formative and su summative? And do you reflect that in your teaching? 90% of the time, the answer is no. So in unit planning, this is what I was talking about earlier. You start with a fixed number of points per day. Um, it's a really good activity for a rookie teacher because now there is a finite amount of points. And then you say, or values, you can have weights. I don't care how you do it. Decide what percentage of these points or values will be accorded to product, summative, process, formative, and progress growth points. You can also have your grades in standards-based grading, which I prefer, is that we have all summative activities are you know, listed in that area and our process is in another area. And you know, you can give it some value, but you know, you don't want it to have a whole lot of value. And but this progress, you know, I've really thought about this a lot is that we have kids who they're like Sisyphus, you know, in a in a high school biology class, and they've got a nine percent uh, MCA score in reading, and they always get to fifty four percent. Yeah, you did really good. I just can't pass you. And, and then they go take it again and they get 58%. Yeah, you did really well, but I can't pass you. Um, but when you look at that student, they may, have, they may have done excellent. If we had that grade broke in three categories and we say the summative stuff, you didn't do very well with, you had 50, 54%. The process, the formative work, um, you did all the daily work. You tried on everything, that's awesome. Um, so I'm giving them formative, a formative score. Maybe they're, a, maybe they're a, an A or a E for excellent. And their progress, your growth was awesome. I'm giving you an E for growth. I'm giving you an E for formative. And I'm gonna give you a D, does not meet the standards at this point for summative. And then I'm also going to say, what were the types of things even within that does not meet what are the things that you mastered and what are the things that you did not? Can you replicate a unit, an assignment, a rubric, a plan? If we can simply take one unit and teach a teacher how to do one unit well, then they should be able to replicate that into another unit. So I am really big on the unit planning, which would be uh, probably something from uh, um, um, Wiggins and McTighe um, about understanding by design. Um, backwards planning. I think this is what you can do when you teach a teacher to do a single unit. If you can plan one's 15 day unit, you can plan one, you can plan several on end. What are the most important activities you want to include? If inquiry is a goal, and rather than just saying that I really want to work on inquiry, can you include an inquiry type of activity on day seven of each unit? Uh, do you want to go outside? Do you want to incorporate outside activities? Do you want to bring in somebody from the, from the outside for each unit? So you really force you to communicate with parents in your community. Uh, you can build that into your unit plans um, a lot easier and you can make sure that um, one of the things that I tell teachers all the time is that I don't want you to change everything and say, you're just going to totally upend your teaching practices. I really only want you to, to change 5% per year. And in this 15 day unit idea, I really want you to keep changing a day or two out of every unit. And if you do that and you replicate that for every unit you do and all the classes that you do, think about the growth that you would have as a teacher. Changing even one day of instruction out of 15 will change 12 days per year. That's, that's a really big change. Changing even five minutes per day uh, doing uh, bell ringer activities when you come into a class where they come in and you've got some special activity on the board. That's like a 10% change. That's incremental growth. Using Michael Fullen, you constantly seek small incremental growth and you just want to keep stacking small incremental growth on top of each other. 
Um, these are my influences and links that I will provide you with this. But uh, Thomas Gusky, um, the five obstacles to grading. Um, one of the things that, I mean, if you, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that's an excellent, excellent foundation for grading if you haven't read that. Uh, Dylan William, that's, uh, he's got a website that's, you know, all things PLC, um, all things uh, assessment. Ken O'Connor, uh, high school math teacher turned uh, administrator of a province in, uh, in uh, Canada. It seems somehow all these good things come from Toronto and up that way. Well, Fullen, O'Connor, um, all of these folks. Uh, Dylan William is from you know, Britain, but they seem to uh, have uh, an edge on us when it comes to assessment. Uh, Mike Schmoker, the results now, again, an English teacher. He really, he re great for your English people to read uh, stuff by Schmoker. Rick Stiggins, grading four versus of. Wiggins and McTie, backward design, UBD. Uh, Danny Hill, uh, the ICU concepts of making sure that of, you know, doing your formative that you're not assigning zeros and things like that, which you'll also read up here in Ken O'Connor. And then Myron Duke, grading smarter, not harder. Um, so any final thoughts? I'm, I'm in inside of 115. That's good for me. I can talk about this stuff all day. Okay. Good Friday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.